This lovely old church in Bothwell, Tasmania, is our subject. I spend a lot of time looking at drawings on social media. And in this drawing of this reference that I've done, I've incorporated a dozen of what I believe are mistakes because I don't believe it's an intentional choice that I see repeatedly in scenes such as this. But can I suggest that you pause the video for a minute and try and work out how many things do you think could have been done better or more accurately that are significant enough to be one of my 12 points. After that, I'll redraw this scene, but I'll incorporate all the 12 things I've said, and then we'll compare these two drawings side by side and just see what the difference is with that extra focus in producing a somewhat realistic view of this church. So if you want to try and get the points yourself, do it now. And welcome back. Here are my points. The first is that I've simply used the wrong pen for the drawing I'm trying to do. And when I say by the drawing I'm trying to do, I mean both for the amount of detail I'm wanting to show and for the space in which I'm drawing it. The smaller our space is, the more important the thickness of the line is because the thickness of the line takes up space. It takes up a lot more space than the actual edges that we see. And so if our line's too thick, it will push the object wider and wider. And also, it may mean that in details that in our reference have a fairly light effect, end up looking rather heavy handed. So this was drawn with a 0.5 millimeter pen. I'm going to use a 0.3 millimeter pen when I redraw this after I give you the rest of these points. My second point is this tree has been basically drawn over the top of the church building. So the church was drawn and then the tree was basically drawn and colored in over the top. A far better approach would be if drawing the architecture first, as probably is the case, is to draw what we can, but leave the area that's going to be complicated by the tree and the foliage. When we've drawn that, we know where to put this and we can, as I prefer to, stop our lines just before the foliage. So it helps gives a sense of three dimension that this tree is in front of what's behind it. This third, I believe, mistake is a very common one. And that's when we have a subject such as this that has bricks or blocks of stones or tiles that there are lines put on the drawing to represent that. But the lines are too heavy, again, for the effect that we have in our scene. And so they drag much more attention than that detail does in the reference, and the scale isn't correct. Invariably, the tiles, the bricks, the slate are all too large, and that messes with the overall effect and often the perceived size of the building. It can make the building look a lot smaller than it really is. The fourth point, now this is surprisingly common, more so in scenes of nature and landscapes where pathways are more common, but if we look at the pathway here, we see it's, it's like a hook. It starts wide, but it curves round, and from what we see, it comes to a point. The actual shape we see here, we know in 3D, it's the same width all the way along, but from this angle with the foreshortening, it narrows over here. But so often, I see paths that are drawn more from what we know about this path, which is that it is the same width the whole way along. And we let that affect what we draw. Careful observation for this sort of thing is vital. Point number five is quick, but it's there are these strong, hard, straight lines at the base of the building. And when we look at architecture, particularly when it's sitting on a grassy surface, is that we usually have a soft edge, as I like to call it, because we have grass coming up against it. We have hard edges here where we have stone on stone and it's being carved to a sharp corner, but we don't have that where the grass comes up against it. And so this ends up looking very artificial. And again, it's a heavier line than the effect that we visually have in our reference. So it upsets the balance of the details, which are more prominent when we look at our reference compared to what is prominent when we look at our drawing. Sixth one, this is very common, and that's that 
there are lots of depth lines not put in, particularly with these windows. If we look here, we can see that these glass panes are actually set back quite some way and that gives us a depth line and over here as well. Now I've just I've just drawn them on as if they're shapes of black contact adhesive that's just been stuck on the wall. So a sense of three dimensions is very important for creating a sense of reality. Otherwise we start to get a cartoon effect when we don't want one. G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. If you're finding any of these helpful, then please help me out and hit the like button for this video. And I'd be really interested at the end to know which of these 12 problems in drawing might be ones you might have to work on. But learning to see them is the start of learning to push past them. Let's get back to them and then see how the drawing turns out when I redraw it, being careful not to do the 12 things that I did in this drawing. Point number seven is this grass that we have in front here. Grass is such a common element in a landscape drawing and yet it's so often handled not particularly well. And the problem is, and I've exaggerated this problem a bit here, is that instead of looking at what we see where the grass is and thinking, how can I create that effect? What marks can I make? We resort to more a symbol for drawing grass that we've probably seen in cartoons or seen in other drawings, or maybe we've worked it out ourselves. And we put that and we dab it around as if it's a stamp we're just stamping. And what we often end up doing is, is putting it all the way back or some distance back. And yet in real life, even if we could see the grass here, the grass here would certainly not be visible as individual blades of grass. And yet it's very easy when we just start doing this to take these marks all the way back. When in fact, if perhaps we saw a few blades of grass down here, with foreshortening, our ability to discern individual blades disappears very quickly as the distance increases. So we need to stop going, oh, grass. Yes, I know how to draw that. And we stop looking at our reference and we grab a symbol to represent grass. The effect is not one of realism. This next one is probably the most common of all these mistakes, certainly where architecture is involved. And that's the perspective angles have been lessened. So here we have the perspective angle at the top of the roof. Now this should be parallel, but we can see that when we check what I've drawn here, it's, it's not nearly as steep, it's a lot flatter. And the same thing happens over here as well. If we're not particularly used to looking at architecture, these roof lines, these perspective angles may look quite fine to us. And yet I think visually these angles add dramatic interest. I think they create a, a visual tension when combined with the other lines that we've now lost here, where it's like everything has just drooped slightly and we've lost the energy that the angles give us if we work hard to capture them. Number nine, is another very common one, and that's to do with the cross hatching I've used for the shadows of the tree here. Hatchings where we draw lines in one direction to create a value, to create a darkness of whatever degree we want. Cross hatching is when we do another layer on top that crosses over the first layer, and we can, in effect, create grayscale using a line. But a very common mistake I see is that this is applied, again, as if it were a cut out piece of contact adhesive just being stuck over whatever is behind it. In this case, quite a bit of complex architecture with walls and buttresses and other walls coming in at right angles with a lot of changing of direction. The effect here of just layering this cross hatching over the top means that this has become more prominent, more obvious than the sense of the building behind. A better approach. Now, I don't think there is any correct way to cross hatch. Whatever looks most effective for your drawing, I think is the best option. But generally, I find putting my cross hatching lines in some way to emphasize the form and the position of the form to us as the viewer in some way works best.
And I think every single one of these points, I have at least one, if not dozens of videos on, if you're interested in looking further. Number 10 is really common. And that's that in looking at the trees, instead of saying, okay, well, here's an effect of foliage. How can I create this effect using my pen, using this pen on my paper? So that what we see here looks like this, because clearly I can't draw this directly. What often happens is that instead of trying to work out how to represent the effect, we end up using a pattern, which with foliage is very often this squiggly line that curls and rolls and comes back on itself, something like this. And sometimes in places it's done more heavily and it does create a bit of a darker effect. But what this becomes is really more like a pattern and it creates the effect, I think, of a piece of pattern paper that's been just cut out and glued on the top, very flat, very two dimensional. So if we're trying to create a sense of three dimensions of depth in our scene, doing our trees with a pattern for the foliage, instead of trying to create the effect that we see with our marks, certainly doesn't help that. And I have a playlist on drawing trees, if that's something you're interested in further. The 11th error really piggybacks on the pattern for the tree. And that's that when we use this pattern for our foliage, what usually happens is we only have one pattern or our patterns are all so close, they really do look the same. Which means that when we have different trees in our reference, very different trees in this case, we end up doing foliage that looks the same. It looks like out of the sheet of paper that we cut out this foliage shape, we also cut this foliage shape out and stuck it down. So we lose the ability really to represent different trees well. And in some scenes, the variety of trees is a lot of the visual interest that we have in a scene, or the contrasts are really important for the composition. And we potentially lose all these when we can't really distinguish one tree from another by the marks that we made. And I do have a number of videos that are particularly on distinguishing marks for different types of tree. I've got one video with 24 different marks to represent different foliage, if you're interested. And my last point, before you very quickly see me redraw this and get to compare the difference that not making these mistakes make, is losing track of scale when we draw. And by scale, I mean everything in relative proportion to each other. And this tower ends up being too wide in both directions from this corner, but particularly in this direction. Now, this easily happens because we're drawing the detail across, and particularly if we have a thicker pen, I mentioned this at the start, by the time we add all the detail moving across, or at least some of it, and allow for the thickness of the line, and because of the thickness of the many vertical lines we're making, we end up simply moving across further than we want to. Again, if we just saw this, the fact that this visually now is tilted towards us in effect compared to this wall isn't so obvious. And this tree being here blocks some of the problems with that if we were drawing further down. But when we look at our reference, we can see how this is a much more interesting angle and contrast. And it looks more right that this is probably half the distance, you know, instead of being from there to there, it should be from there to there. So keeping the scale correct is really important, particularly as we move further and further away from where we start. We have to keep observing how things line up and what they line up with and just things such as what is the distance from there to there to there to there, the proportions. I have a recent video on keeping proportions correct as we draw, if you're interested in that. So let me now redraw this, albeit very sped up, and we'll compare the two. So here we go at just over five times my real life drawing speed for this, which took just under 45 minutes in real time. Now I'm using a 0 0.3 millimeter pen, so that lets my lines be lighter, thinner, and I can get more lines closer together without it becoming overly dark. Now you can see I'm working hard to keep the angles correct. I reserve space with that for that tree, you'll notice, and I'm reserving space now for the tree on the right-hand side. I'm measuring the angles as I want to do, 
or at least checking them after I've put some indicator marks with my pen. And now I'm just trying to position this entrance way here on the left and to work out exactly what the architecture of this porch is, which was a bit difficult to discern because of the shadow. But that's okay. If we can't really see it in our reference, we can capture the effect if we, if we work at it that we don't need to see it because we capture the ambiguities in our drawing that are in the photo. I like to think of drawing as not of, of copying an object, not of outlining a shape, but of capturing an effect in whatever marks we use on the paper. Many of them will be lines, even straight lines, depending on what we're drawing. But if we think marks, it gives us a whole lot more at our fingertips. You'll notice I put the depth line on those windows, those round windows and the long ones. And so now I'm doing the tower and I'm again working at the perspective angles. I'm also working to make sure that I keep this right hand side of the tower sloping at the right angle. You'll notice I didn't get the angle correct with my first mark, but I checked it and was able to correct it before I'd made too much of a mess on the paper. And I worked at how wide it had to be the tower and then I came back and make sure I squeezed the detail into that. Some marks to indicate the stones and I think a better job of capturing the scale than in my first drawing. Now I'm trying to capture the effect of this tree. This tree is very dark and so I've really not been able to make too much of a difference between the local colour, the purple, and where that purple is in shade. With the green of the tree on the left, it was a little more straightforward. So you can see me doing some hatching lines for the shadow on the church building, trying to allow some reflection of the underlying shape. But I do realise that I'm going to be making that darker again, so I'm not getting too caught up with how it is right at this point. And so now with this tree, using different marks in different ways to create a different effect, which hopefully at a glance still says tree. It still reads as a tree. I do those two dark spots look a bit like eyes, don't they? Bit of a face there with hair coming up. Oh man, I can see, <laughs> I can see the face so clearly now. So now just working on some of the values to make some of the shadows darker. Here we have our two drawings side by side. This second one here, where I made every effort to avoid the mistakes that were incorporated into this drawing. To me, this one has a stronger sense of realism to it. This one is looking very much like a drawing that represents the scene rather than captures the scene. And when we have a reference, we usually want to capture something of the feel of how the place looks. As I mentioned earlier, I'd love to hear in the comments which of these 12 issues you might be thinking you can work on in the future. But look, whatever you draw, however you draw it, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.